The other thing I want to share uh, in this sort of introductory, you know, these first couple hours, is the understanding of the mind and all the different ways that our experience can relate to ET manifestations. Now, there's something called uh, in the Vedic tradition, the siddhis, S-I-D-D-H-I-S. These are different abilities and powers that people can develop as they develop higher consciousness. Now, these run the gamut of almost everything you've heard about, some of which has been relegated to mythology, but is actually very real, such as levitation, dematerialization, materialization, um, changes in your body density to move through solid objects, precognition, we've talked about, uh, teleportation, uh, telepathy, uh, materialization of objects, et cetera, and so on and so forth. Now, those are all things that actually humans can do. Those are advanced applications of higher states of consciousness. Uh, but understand that there's a scientific correlation to every conscious city. So whatever that you can imagine that any enlightened master has done can be routinized or made routine through a scientific method, even when it, up, up to and including levels of the astral, you may call celestial, conscious cos, com, cosmos, and do it scientifically. I always tell people that the, uh, <laughs> a really hilarious story of this captain of a Navy contract vessel that was in the South Pacific in 63. Jacques Vallée had the story, but he didn't have the source. It was a third-hand story for him, where we had we were testing the, uh, I think they were the, the, the Atlas uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles. We were firing them downstream in the South Atlantic, and this captain who contacted me was on a ship that was retrieving them after a test fire. Now these were not hot, they didn't have uh, you know, nuclear weapons on them, they were trying to get the missile to be accurate. But the missiles kept missing their mark and they knew there was some kind of a subtle electromagnetic thing happening. And there was always an ET craft around. And they got these on radar. So one night, his radar guy, they had a new, I think it was RCA radar system, and it was sweeping around and it, they picked up a craft. And so the, ca the captain was called, came up, they got it. He called the command center, and they got it on radar. Unfortunately, they then hit it with some kind of electronic weapon or something. And the thing blew up. It kind of, there was an explosion in the sky, and it fell straight down into the water, this, this UFO. And uh, the next morning, his ship was vectored into the point of impact. Um, and they couldn't find the ship, but there was about a six-foot square pod that ejected, that had four of um, the ET beings in it. And this, this guy was a salt of the earth Navy guy, and he said, well, they were handsome little men. Uh, well, they had their skin was the color of a Sicilian. I never forget him saying that, Sicilian, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, bronze colored, um, had no hair, no penna, which is the, f the, the penna is the flap, the monkey ears we have. They just have openings, fine lips, a sort of small nose. And just like the man that contacted me from Skunk Works at Lockheed about the astral projection experience, this person contacted me to find out something that had bugged him. It's, been, it's, it's stuck in his mind and bothered him for 40 years. And, he, he, and I said, well, what is it? He says, well, we got him out of this thing, this pod. They were ordered to put him in the ship's freezer. Um, till the a submarine, nuclear submarine came along and took them, and they were all threatened with death if they talked about this. Um, and the, he says, these little men were in <laughs> sort of these metallicized uh, fabric. It was almost metal, metal soft metal-like fabric, one-piece suits. I said, yeah, like a onesie. But they didn't have any buttons or zippers. And he said, they, how could they have gotten in them? And I've said, this is why you're calling me? <laughs> <laughs> and it was. This was exactly why he was calling me. And I said, well, 
I don't know if you're going to like my answer. And he said, well, tell me. I know those damn things, you could have to cut them off, but we couldn't even cut them. I said, well, the way that they, the suit is made, they just stand into an energy field that has a resonant, and it materializes around them. Like 3D printing, but like a 3D, but zip. So there are no, and it comes off the same way. It dematerializes off and materializes on. But I said, did you notice anything about this um, thing that they were in that, you, that was floating? And he said, yeah, it had no pieces. I said the same thing. So uh, I call this uh, sort of a infra-ultrasonic manufacturing, where if you imagine going beyond the speed of light, speed of electrons, beyond the zero-point energy field, and creating a, sort of an architectural blueprint of a spacecraft that's in that dimension, like an astral, like your astral body, and have that resonate, and it comes into this dimension in toto. So it recruits the atoms, the molecules, the structures, not by digging them up and smelting them and banging them and doing rivets like we do on an airplane, but it, and that's, I call this extraterrestrial manufacturing 101 that I'm sharing with you. So that's why these spacecraft, the guys who I know who've uh, gone to ones that have retrieved them, they're seamless. Now if you see one that has rivets and seams and parts that are, that's Lockheed and Northrop's and Boeing's anti-gravity stuff. But these, the ET ones, are completely seamless and the light coming from them is so amazing, it's so pure, you never quite forget it because the light is coming from a source and materials that aren't manufacturable. You couldn't even manufacture something that pure in space. And there was a part of a craft that they got in Brazil, and I forget it had mag mag magnesium and some other stuff in it, but the, the elements that were in it were so pure that even in the vacuum of space we could not manufacture it. And no one understood how they could be doing this. I said, because they're not going to some asteroid or planet and digging up stuff out of the earth and smelting it and melting it and then putting it together. They're creating a, a, a field and it resonates and then comes in from that trans-dimensional virtual, ast near astral, I call it, the near astral. And it then pops as a totality into 3D. Make sense? Which, if you study the literature of, of the craft that have been retrieved and even the clothing on these beings, they're consistently this same report. Now, what is, why is that important? Because it means that when you're out under the stars and you see something, and if it seems just, it's too beautiful to be real, it looks like a jewel. We were once in Colorado and there was an object, it looked like it was a, it looked like it was a crystalline jewel in the sky. And it was there for a number of minutes and you couldn't even, it, it, it was painful, it was so beautiful. And then there was a, a, a fighter jet was vectored in and the thing popped and began to dry, go off, looked exactly like a 737. Everyone saw it. So, you know, but the, what's, what's fascinating is, is, is the purity of the light and the quality of it. And then there's one more thing. These craft are imbued at the level of uh, nanobiotechnology. You know what that is, nano, uh, where they're actually living and they're conscious. So the craft itself has the consciousness of the occupants, and often it's the, the, the chief pilot or the person who's actually uh, directing it, which is usually, they will either touch it and think and they'll go, all right? But the craft itself is not just like a piece of machinery, it's actually living. And there have been more than one military guy I've interviewed who have been on uh, retrieval missions when they get there and the craft has uh, been injured, I call it injured because it's, it's, or, it's organic, and there'll be a crack and it'll be trying to heal. Like if you did a cut and did a time lapse of a healing of a wound on skin, it's doing this kind of thing, trying to fix itself. And so the craft themselves are nano 
biotechnology at the level where they then can subsume or take on the awareness of the occupants. And that's how they operate. So many times people have an experience with a UFO, but they'll feel that the UFO itself was communicating or was conscious. I say, well, it is. That it was like this living, organic, conscious thing. Uh, and many times people will dismiss it, and I'll go, no, thousands of people had the same experience. And it's because it is. It is a living, conscious nanobiotechnology at the level that it can then take on the awareness of the occupant or the occupants. But usually it's the main occupant who is the well, anthropocentrically projecting here, captain or the person in charge. Yeah.